A quick new idea, daily, from the world's greatest TEDx talks. I'm your host, Atosa Leone, and this is TEDx Shorts. When we tweet about current events, we're usually just speaking for ourselves. But what if you were posting on behalf of a government? Social media makes it easy for world leaders to share one's private discussions about diplomacy with a global audience. But is it smart to give the world real-time glimpses of delicate closed-door negotiations? Rebecca Adler Neeson is a political scientist. And today, she looks at how social media use by heads of state has quickly altered the foreign affairs landscape. Back in 2007, Barack Obama was the first world leader or among the first to create his own Twitter account. And only a handful of him followed followed that year of, of our heads of state of government. Didn't really dare to do so. So he became president. And since then... The use of social media by our heads of state and government has exploded. 178 countries from 92% of all UN member states representing an audience or reaching out to an audience of 356 million Twitter users. They have their own Twitter accounts, these leaders. Now, of course, the public was always important. But this embrace of online channels And this transparency has created a world of openness that we have never experienced before. But in the hands of our political leaders, a smartphone can become a lethal weapon. And I can clearly see how these open doors, they challenge diplomacy's three foundational pillars. The first pillar of diplomacy, that's time. Why time? Why does diplomacy require time? It requires time because you need that time to mature a process of negotiation. When I was working in the Danish foreign ministry, we were preparing the meetings and we would start weeks and actually sometimes months before the summit, circulating ideas, having pre-meetings at very low levels, drafting ideas on everything from uh, refugee policy to energy, uh, anti-terrorism, to get those compromises just right. And then I remember in the, in the days before the summit, we would work long hours, really, really long hours, um, basically staying in the ministry throughout the night in order to get the words right for our prime minister. We were drafting the speech notes. And what kept us going through those very long days and nights, that wasn't caviar or, or champagne, but that was pizza, takeaway pizza, and coffee, lots of coffee. And the knowledge that our colleagues in Bratislava, in Athens, in Berlin, they were doing exactly the same thing. And they were doing this because they sincerely knew and believed that we were contributing, we were contributing with peaceful solutions and compromises between our countries. So that's time. Crucial. But the second pillar of diplomacy is space. You need a confidential space to find out where the other party's red line really lies. Without that confidential or safe space, there's simply no room to to maneuver, to have a mental wiggle room or to improvise or, or just brainstorm collectively. And that's why when you had to end the civil war in Yugoslavia, you basically had to fly in 1995 the warring parties out of the country all the way to Dayton, Ohio, And that then resulted in that compromise, the Dayton Agreement, the Peace Agreement, away from press, away from domestic constituencies. So a confidential space. But the third pillar of diplomacy is tact, or what we in diplomatic language call protocol. It's all about saving the face of the other. It's about taking into consideration the emotions or feelings of the other person. And it's actually not that weird. If you think about entering a bus and the bus is full and you would really like a seat, but it's full. Then there's an elderly lady, you see her, she's sitting and she's put her hand back next to her on the seat, the only free seat. Then you don't go, um, 
move your stuff, lady. You say, uh, excuse me, is this seat taken? And she'll probably remove the bag. Now that's tact, right? If you move that to the international level, where the tensions are really, really high, where the cultural differences may be enormous, then you know why diplomats, they disagree, but they disagree without being disagreeable. Now, all these three pillars of diplomacy are fundamentally challenged by the 24-7 coverage of every single foreign policy event and social media. If you take time and space, leaders, they, they rush to be the first to tweet. And of course, mistakes and blunders happen. And this leads to a great risk of conflict escalation. Last year, the Pakistani defense minister reacted to a news article he'd read. And he'd read that uh, actually Israel was threatening Pakistan with nuclear weapons. And so he felt the need to react on Twitter, of course. And he said, um, hey, Israel, by the way, remember, Pakistan is a nuclear power too. Okay, just think about it just for one second. This is one nuclear power threatening almost explicitly another nuclear power with war on Twitter. Now, as the Israeli defense ministry had to explain, that actually the whole story, the statement attributed to the former Israeli defense minister was never said. In fact, the whole story was entirely false. Fake story. Okay, patience is gone. But so is confidentiality. And tact is gone too, because you can only be so diplomatic in 140 characters. So, are we just doomed to watch these Twitter wars run out of control and the world becoming a more dangerous place? How can we use social media constructively in international relations? Why don't we create a kind of a, a rule book, a um, do's and don'ts for diplomats on social media, a kind of guideline, this is what you should do and not, and not do. The problem with that option is that either our leaders wouldn't follow these rules because they're not binding, or if they did, nobody would put any attention to these tweets because they would be way too polished and frankly, way too boring. So the problem with these solutions, these answers, is that they don't really touch the core of the problem. The core of the problem is that we simply only scratch the surface. We only scratch the surface when we talk about these issues. The problem is we credit those that are loud and visible and we neglect those discrete negotiators. Most fundamentally, and we help them doing that, social media turns our leaders' attention away from the tedious work of brokering deals to managing their public face. The TEDx talk you just listened to was recorded at a TEDx event in Copenhagen, Denmark. All TEDx events are independently organized by volunteers who believe in TED's mission of ideas worth spreading. Special thanks to the organizing team at TEDx Copenhagen Salon. Visit TED.com slash TEDx Shorts to listen to the full talk and learn more about TEDx Shorts. I'm Atosa Leone. Thanks for listening and see you tomorrow.